Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Good evening and welcome to this special edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. This is the 2016 Prophetic Year in Review, Part 1. 2016 was an astounding year with staggering prophetic implications. The world saw significant steps in technology and at the same time, a general acceptance of Big Brother type micro surveillance of every part of our lives. Globalism's march toward dominance hit major roadblocks in Europe and the United States. Acts of terrorism increased across the world and shook Europe and the United States. The deadliest were in the Middle East, but have become so common they get little notice in the Western media. Some watchdog groups estimate that 2016 saw more than 1,800 acts of terrorism with a death toll of almost 16,000. This week and next, we will look at the major trends and events of 2016 in the light of Bible prophecy. This week, we will examine the 2016 events involving God's prophetic time clock, Israel. Zechariah 12 describes a time in the tribulation when the whole world will turn against Israel. Thus declares the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. And it will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. The fulfillment of that scripture is yet future, but the events of 2016 show that future cannot be far off. Jerusalem is already a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. Jerusalem is already a heavy stone for all the peoples, more so today than even a couple of weeks ago. And in 2016, all the nations of the earth were already gathered against it. We can see the political fulfillment of a scripture that will one day be fulfilled militarily. As 2016 ended, the Obama administration finally removed all doubt about where it stands in the Middle East conflict. Stunningly, it chose the side of terrorism, war, death, and destruction. A few weeks ago on this program, I said that the president holds great disdain for the nation of Israel as it presently exists. I warn that he might end his time in office, turning against Israel at the United Nations. On the Friday afternoon just before Christmas, the eve of Hanukkah, he did exactly that. On that day, with the United States' consent, the UN Security Council passed Resolution 2334. It condemned Israel as the illegal occupier of Palestinian lands. It is one of the most cynical, hypocritical resolutions in UN history. It speaks of Palestinian territory occupied since 1967, including East Jerusalem. The Security Council consists of five permanent members, Russia, the United Kingdom, France, China, and the United States. It also has 10 non-permanent members, each of them serving a two-year term. Any of the permanent members has the power to veto any resolution. Traditionally, the U.S. has vetoed anything that threatens Israel's security, sovereignty, or legitimacy. 
President Obama waited until the final days of the administration to change that policy. Resolution 2334 is the height of hypocrisy. One permanent member of the Security Council, Russia, illegally occupies Crimea. Crimea is a historical and valuable region of the Ukraine that Russia invaded and stole in 2014. The Ukrainians did not attack Russia. Vladimir Putin simply saw the strategic importance of Crimea and decided to use military force to seize it. Israel took the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, and the area known as the West Bank during the Six-Day War in 1967. But Israel seized this land to defend its national existence and protect the lives of its citizens after it was attacked by the surrounding nations. Another permanent member of the UN Security Council, China, is right now in the process of stealing the South China Sea. The Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague ruled in August that China has no right to that area, but China is invading it anyway. No nation attacked or even threatened China. The Chinese are not taking the area in a defensive action. They're simply stealing it, even as they join the rest of the Security Council in condemning Israel. To rescind Resolution 2334 would require a majority of the Security Council and all of the permanent members. That's not going to happen. In that sense, it's like the law of the Medes and the Persians, unchangeable. By allowing it to pass, the Obama administration did something that the incoming Trump administration will not be able to overturn. As I discussed on the last week's program, in Daniel chapter 6, enemies of Israel used the same kind of legal weapon in an attempt to destroy Daniel. Several years after the Mede and Persian Empire conquered Babylon, a group of government officials grew jealous of Daniel's influence with the king. They came to the king and said, King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man beside you, O king, for the 30 days will be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. King Darius fell for their flattery and signed the law. He foolishly did not consider that it would condemn Daniel, his wisest and most reliable advisor and overseer. Daniel continued to pray three times a day, just as before. The men went back to the king and said, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept deserting himself to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. Even the king was powerless against the law of the Medes and the Persians. Once the law was on the books, there was no hope. Well, almost none. At some point during the day when he was trying to figure out a way to save Daniel, a powerful truth struck King Darius. He followed the law and cast Daniel into the lion's den. But before they sealed Daniel in, 
the king made this remarkable statement. Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. You know the story. God did deliver Daniel, and that's what will happen here. The resolution can't be broken, but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lives today, and he will deliver Israel. But there's another lesson to be learned here, too. Those who deviously plotted against Daniel to destroy him were themselves later delivered to the lions. Both Republicans and Democrats quickly condemned the administration's betrayal of Israel, including most members of Congress. The reaction was so strong that Secretary of State John Kerry tried desperately Despite to defend the U.S. action. Last week, he delivered an unusually long speech to his employees at the State Department. In his tirade, he attacked Israel with a level of contempt that surprised the world. Early on, he quoted Israel's permanent representative to the United Nations. Ambassador Danny Dannon had said it was to be expected that Israel's greatest ally would act in accordance with the values that we share and veto the resolution. Kerry said, I am compelled to respond today that the United States did, in fact, vote in accordance with our values. Really? Then why is this the first administration in history to declare that East Jerusalem belongs to the Palestinians? In previous elections, President Obama also ran as a friend to Israel. To say that this resolution reflects our values is to say that America supports and rewards terrorism because that's exactly what this resolution does. President Obama and members of his administration have said that they will destroy ISIS, not negotiate with them, not appease them, but destroy them. Folks, there's not a dime's worth of difference between ISIS and Hamas. Yet the world expects Israel to negotiate with a government that is at least partially, if not completely, run by Hamas. In 2014, the two Palestinian parties, Fatah and Hamas, formed a unity government. Even without Hamas, the Fatah-led government of President Mahmoud Abbas is impossible to negotiate with even though it is portrayed in the West as a moderate organization, Fatah directly finances terrorism. It gives financial rewards to the families of terrorists. Fatah teaches the values of terrorism in the schools. The Center for Near East Policy Research found that over 200 Palestinian textbooks, from civics to mathematics, teach children to kill Jews and sacrifice themselves as martyrs. The worst part is that these books have all supposedly been vetted by the U.S. government. One poem said, Hearing weapons clash is pleasant to my ear, and the flow of blood gladdens my soul. That's what they teach their children. The maps in these books simply remove any reference to Israel. The children are taught that Israel does not exist. The Palestinians won't be happy with East Jerusalem. They want all of it. They won't be happy with the West Bank. They want the utter annihilation of Israel. How do you make peace with that? The Abbas government publicly praises terrorists, even naming streets after them. President Abbas once said, we bless every drop of blood that has been spilled for Jerusalem, which is clean and pure blood. Blood spilled for Allah, Allah willing. Every martyr will reach paradise 
and everyone wounded will be rewarded by Allah. Abbas didn't say that 20 years ago or five years ago. He said it in 2016. Either Secretary Kerry does not understand or he doesn't care, but those are not American values. In 2016, outside threats to Israel rose dramatically. Aviv Kuchavi is head of Israel's military intelligence. He said that 200,000 missiles are aimed at Israel at any given time. The terror group Hezbollah by itself accounts for between 120 to 150,000 of those missiles. Hezbollah sits on Israel's northern border in Lebanon and Syria. Military analysts Stefani Cohen and Shai Osran, writing for the Tower, said, Hezbollah is probably the world's largest, most sophisticated, wealthiest, and most militarily capable terror organization, created, trained, funded, and deployed as a proxy of the Iranian government, with operations spanning Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Americas, the Shiite group has effectively taken over the Lebanese government. In fact, their man just became the president, launched thousands of rockets at Israeli civilians, and murdered more Americans than anyone other than Al-Qaeda, all of these making it into perhaps the most fearsome weapon in the jihadist anti-Western arsenal. Hamas is the enemy inside Israel that is sworn to its destruction. Hezbollah is the enemy that waits just outside the door. Thank you so much for standing with me as a watchman on the wall. I thank God for sending me such loyal partners, and I pray daily that he will reward your faithfulness and protect and prosper you in these very difficult times. Thank you again from the bottom of my heart. UNESCO is the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. In October, UNESCO adopted a resolution that denies Israel's historic connection to the Temple Mount and the Western Wall. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu responded. He said, that denying the history is like saying that China has no connection to the Great Wall of China or that Egypt has no connection to the pyramids. UNESCO's job is the protection of heritage. Yet their resolution denies 3,000 years of Jewish heritage. It also denies our Christian heritage. Jesus called the temple my father's house. He taught there often. The UNESCO resolution never refers to the site as the Temple Mount. It doesn't mention the historical Jewish temples built there. UNESCO refers to it only as Al-Haram Al-Sharif, Arabic for the Noble Sanctuary. Muslims believe that a magical horse named Burak flew Muhammad to the seventh heaven using the Temple Mount as a launch pad. UNESCO's resolution calls the Wailing Wall the Virak Wall. It also conveniently omits the fact that at the time this fiction supposedly occurred, a Christian church sat on the spot. This is yet another sample of the UN's willingness to deny history, archaeology, and common sense to boost Islam and attack the Jews. In 2016, Israeli Ambassador Danon said that the hatred of the Jews and the demonization of Israel has reached the highest level of our lifetimes. He said over one-third of European Jews are afraid to wear a yarmulke or Star of David in public. More than half of French Jews have considered immigrating 
because they don't feel safe living as Jews in France. Today, we hear things about Jews and the Jewish people that we thought belonged to the pages of history. Anti-Semitism is returning to everyday life without shame. He noted that 63% of all anti-Semitic tweets specifically call for violence against Jews. It was more dangerous to be a Jew in 2016 than it has been in a very long time. In Israel, Arabs and Jews live and work side by side. Arabs, even Muslim Arabs, have full rights as citizens. But with Resolution 2334, the UN is calling for the ethnic cleansing of Judea and Samaria, which they call the West Bank. Ethnic cleansing means to remove an entire group of people from a certain area because of their ethnicity. Wars have been fought because of ethnic cleansing, both to promote it and to prevent it. In this case, the Obama administration is calling for the ethnic cleansing of Jews from their ancestral lands of Judea and Samaria. Do the so-called settlements break existing agreements between Israel and the Palestinians? No. The Oslo Accords carefully avoid any such agreement. They specifically say that the status of such settlements is yet to be negotiated. Are these occupied territories as Resolution 2334 claims? No. The Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs makes the case as there had been no internationally recognized legal sovereign in either the West Bank or Gaza prior to the 1967 Six-Day War. They cannot be considered to have become occupied territory when control passed into the hands of Israel. Israel does not requisition privately owned lands for the establishment of settlements. During Jordan's occupation of Judea and Samaria, Jews were illegally and forcibly removed from the land. That is the only time in over a thousand years that Jews were prohibited from living in those areas. People who held legal title to the land were stripped of it because of their ethnicity. During that time, Jordan declared it a capital offense to sell land to a Jew. Does Obama want to return to that? Apparently so. Iran is gobbling up client states right and left. Saudi Arabia is trying to enforce its will across the region. But the UN focuses its animosity on the region's only open democracy. Why do they gang up on the teeny state of Israel? Three reasons come to mind. First, they want to appease Muslim terrorists. They think that by punishing Jews, it will make radical jihadists reluctant to attack them. But they couldn't be more wrong. History shows a clear pattern here. Appeasement encourages radicals. Second, they do it because they think they can get away with it. They see Israel as small and lacking influence. They believe that with little cost to their nations, they can throw it to the jihadist as a sacrificial offering. But as I said, appeasement won't work against radical Islam. More important, Israel has influence they know nothing of. Finally, and most importantly, they do it because the age-old scourge of anti-Semitism still reigns in their hearts. Deep down, they're fighting the God who created the Jews and Israel to be his own. Just as the ancient prophets and Jesus himself predicted. Never have the predictions of the prophets about the end of the era 
and the coming of Jesus for the true church been so fully and accurately fulfilled as now. If you are unsure that you have ever personally received the forgiveness of your sins that the Lord Jesus paid for with his death, do it right now. Just bow your head and sincerely ask Jesus to come into your heart and forgive your sins by his shed blood for you. He will then enter your heart, forgive all your sins, and begin to train you in what he wants you to be. Well, that's it for tonight, folks. I'll continue the prophetic year in review next week, God willing. I'll see you then. You've been watching the Hal Lindsey Report. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit HalLindsay.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.